Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread. I'm coming to you from the Hans Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we've held the last four bread symposiums. And as you can see, there's nobody here but me. And this is where we usually have it. The seats are all empty because this year, thanks to you, the symposium will be presented online virtually in our new presentation hall, which is where I will join you in just a minute. Thank you, and thanks for being part of our new virtual Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puranos. Welcome again. Throughout the entire symposium, I'll be thanking our generous sponsors over and over again, and ask that you do as well by visiting their booths and pavilions in the Exhibitor Hall. There you will see lots of bonus content and you can also make appointments to meet with the folks from these companies that serve our baking community so well. Our presenting sponsor is Puratos, who has partnered with us from the very beginning for all of our symposiums. And it is their support that helped us get this one of a kind gathering of thought leaders off the ground. Please also visit our fabulous flour and milling sponsors, Ardent Mills. Lindley Mills, and Central Milling. Thank you also to our equipment sponsors, the WP Bakery Group, an allied bakery and food service equipment. And thank you also to our specialty food product companies, ProBioTeam, Fire Within, Big Green Egg, and Mock Mill. Please check out all of their booths to learn about their wonderful and unique products. And also thanks to our media sponsors, Cook's Country, The Local Palette, The James Beard Foundation, and The Bread Baker's Guild of America. You'll be hearing more about all of them throughout the entire series of presentations. So again, thank you to all our sponsors. At the end of today's presentation, you will also see our credit scroll thanking all of the people behind the scenes who made this event possible, including our production and technical partner, Ganoid Communications, our creative team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University, our hosts for this, our fourth annual gathering. So stick around if you will. But now it's time to get things rolling with today's presentation. So let's go live and once again, Welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. Yes, we are live again. And uh, it's like, it feels like deja vu all over again, except we have a new presentation today for you. Uh, for those who, just, who uh, logged in early and got to see uh, the the video that was playing prior to our to, to this moment uh, that was last Monday's presentation by Sebastian Dessels of the uh, WP Bakery Group and I thought um, great the, the the length of that was just the, the perfect fit for that 15 minute window for the early birds so and he covered so much in sort of deep technical stuff that I thought it'd be a great idea for you guys to see it again. Uh, and for those who did miss it and want to go back and see the entire presentation, including the questions, the good questions that came in, uh, go to our archive section in the uh, in, in the lobby next to the, the main lobby. You'll see the, the, the dashboard. Go to the archive and any presentations that you've already missed, you can watch them 24-7. So uh, uh, before we get into today's presentation, reminder that uh, next week we reconvene again on Monday with a new presentation. Chef Frank Murphy, uh, who is going to teach us and show us a video he made, a really creative video about the blazing bulldog. And I'm not going to say too much more about it than that. Read about it in the, uh, you know, on the homepage. Uh, but it's a, it's a project uh, of his working at a school district in Oregon, where they are actually, North Bend, Oregon, where they are actually transforming lives through baking. Uh, so come in and back Monday for that presentation on Wednesday of next week. We'll have Chef Shai Farjian, a, uh, a very talented uh, local chef who um, is, he's a number of restaurants here called Yafo Kitchen, 
where they do fabulous Mediterranean and Middle Eastern foods. Um, and he's going to show how to make kachapore, the, uh, the sort of classic Georgian I don't know, you, flat, flatbread, I guess is the best way to say it. It's like their version of a pizza, but very unique, very creative, but done on a grill. So that's going to be next Wednesday's demo. And beyond that, we've got Sir Jemaya of the uh, Mission to Mars project coming up the following week. We have Michael Calanti on prebiotic breads. So a lot more to come. And don't forget also to visit the uh, sponsor booths, sign the guest books. In a few weeks, we're going to do another drawing. We had our first prize winner last week. Uh, Kathy Lair won the, won the knife. Uh, I've got it right here. As I told you, always, have, and I'm going to be mailing it out to her. But we have some other prizes coming up. So log in. We're going to need at least five uh, sign-ins on the welcome day, in the welcome books, uh, the guest books, for, to be eligible for that spinning wheel competition. All right, that's a lot to cover. Um, but I do want to get to Daisy because Daisy has pre-recorded uh, a, a demo for us. So I want to introduce you, Daisy. Welcome. Uh, you're you're here. You can go ahead and yeah, unmute yourself. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're not going to say too much right now because I want people to see your demo, but is there anything you want to say before we, we kick it over to the video? We'll take questions uh, through the either the chat function or the uh, Q&A section while the video is playing, uh, so, and I'll collect them, and when, for whatever time we have at the end, we'll answer some of those, and we'll continue that conversation in the VIP lounge afterwards. Daisy, where are you coming to us from today? I'm coming from Arlington, Massachusetts, which is just outside of Cambridge. Yeah. Anyways, and it's like 97 degrees, so I'm really glad that I pre-recorded the croissant yeah, demo. Well, really. <laughs> so. I, 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 right this week, I feel like anyone who's under 100 degrees is getting, like, you know, is slipping, yeah. in, so to speak. But that's. Uh, I haven't um, checked the weather with my parents in Texas, but I feel like it must be hotter here <laughs> than it is in Texas. Yeah, yeah. the South is right now. We're only in, in the 80s here, where I live in in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. So mm -hmm. we're counting our blessings, but yep. I'm really <laughs> feeling for our friends. In the Pacific Northwest and yeah. Northern California and, and Canada, where it's where it's over 100 degrees, so uh, we're praying for all of you. Um, but Daisy, anything you want to say before we run the video? Um, I really hope you enjoy it. Um, yeah. All right, you're gonna you'll be back at the end for any questions that, that yeah. arise. We're gonna be learning about uh, if I if I if I understand, I haven't even watched the video myself. It's all about uh, baking destination croissants using local flour. Uh, and uh, high high uh, high extraction rates or you know, blends with whole wheat. So mm -hmm. is that right? All right. Yep. Uh, so we're gonna have our our team out out at uh, Ganoid Productions to go ahead and run the video, and we'll join all of you back here uh, in about forty minutes for Q and A and follow up. Take it away. Hi, I'm Daisy Chow, and I'm the owner and baker at Breadboard Bakery. And today we're going to do some croissants with locally milled flour. Um, so the original title was with high extraction flour, which I've tried. And it was fine, but I found that I had better results using uh, standard bread flour with a percentage of whole wheat flour in it, which is locally milled. And uh, we have a local store that we get our flour from, so I'm happy to support them and use fresh flour. Um, but anyways, let's start with a little mix. <laughs> so our croissant formula is 100% flour, 1.9% salt, 15% sugar, 2.4% osmotolerant yeast, which we hydrate, 47.6% water, and 21%, sorry, 21.6% butter. And then our lock-in butter is 22%, so no weight. Um, I'm going to do a small mix just to show the procedure. So what I'm going to do first is hydrate my yeast. And we use osmotolerant yeast because of the sugar and the butter in the croissant dough. So this is 26 grams right here, and I'm going to hydrate with twice the weight in water. And about 50, 52 grams of water. I'm going to stir that until it looks kind of like a mocha buttercream. And I could just do this in a separate bowl, but I figure. 
get more of the yeast if I just do it straight into the mixing bowl that I'm using. And I'm hydrating the yeast because I wanna make sure that it gets incorporated into the dough well and dissolves. Cause I've seen dough with like little bits of yeast that are still in granules, which haven't been incorporated well. Okay, kind of smeared in there, but there it is. Now I'm going to complete adding my water, 500 grams. Okay. I've got in here my all my flours, my sugar, and my salt. Put that in. The butter should be room temperature because you want to make sure that the butter gets mixed in well into the dough. And if it doesn't, then you're going to have like cold chunks of hard butter when you start pushing it out. We don't have any fancy mixers here. We just have two 20 quart Hobarts and a five quart kitchen aid from my house. <laughs> The relative to the dough, this is kind of a lot of butter. You want to get like about half of the butter in the beginning and then just continue adding as it's mixing. One reason why we started using a mix of red flour and whole wheat flour is because the flour, the whole wheat flour that we were getting was finer and then kind of like lost access to that during COVID, get a different mill of flour, which is a bit coarser. And um, yeah, in order to get croissants with a similar volume, we switched back to a combination of red flour and whole wheat flour. And I really liked the whole wheat flour because I like seeing the flecks of bran in there. And of course it added flavor and a little bit of color to the final bake. I don't just do a straight, you know, traditional bread flour or croissant. I'd also taken a class at, I think, a, a previous wheat stock where one of the instructors, uh, Jeremy Gadwes, did a, a demo on whole wheat croissants. And I was like, that's a no brainer. Why, don't, why wouldn't you always like make croissants with whole wheat and it adds, adds so much more than just a traditional croissant? 
right, all the butter is in. I'm just waiting for it to mix, 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 and get all those dry bits in. So you definitely don't want to see any chunks of butter, like I said, because it will make for things that cook out of your consistent dough. You really don't want that when it's cold. So a couple more dry bits in the bottom. I just want to make sure it gets in there. But this hub part doesn't have a great like tractable, I don't know, distance. A little bit big, so kind of have to help it along sometimes. Doesn't always get everything at the bottom. All right. Okay, so the dough looks fine, a bit dry looking, but it's like heavy in the butter. It will soften up, especially since it has the wheat flour that takes a little bit of time to absorb. Um, I guess the other reason, another reason why I settled on the King Arthur local flour bit was that flour is more consistent. So if you were using a locally milled, like 100% locally milled flour, like locally grown grains, you might have to play with the hydration a bit just to make sure it's the right consistency. So this is about, this is just a really small mix. It's like a quarter of the size of what we would normally do here at the bakery, but for demonstration purposes. So that we've got, I'm just gonna chill it overnight, flattened. I want it to like get as cool as possible without having like warm spots in the middle while the outside cools because it will be fermenting the whole time. All right, that's it. I'm gonna put this away and then I will come back with what I would do, you know, the next day and I'll have that. Sorry, sorry for me, I'm gonna run away for a minute. <laughs> And I'm back. This is 24 hours later. Taking the dough out of the bin, flatten it so it fits underneath the sheeter or under the sheeter bars, and then rolled it out to fit about, I don't know, maybe like three times the width of my butter block. I'm not going to show you how to do, but um, I know our butter blocks are about like. 10 and a half to 11 inches square. So I wanna make sure that it'll fit here and that this will fold around it. So this is what stage I'm at. And this is a this bakery was a former Mexican restaurant. And it turned into a pizza place. So it's not exactly built out to be <laughs> a bakery, but we're just making things work with the things that we have. And the equipment that we have. Okay. 
Okay. So we make our butter blocks here using uh, two large silk hats. And then this one I can already feel has split in half, so it should be fun. And the important thing about butter is to make sure that it's soft enough to be pliable. Like you don't want it melty soft, but you want it to be able to sort of like bend without cracking. And it still stays in one piece. And you really only get this with like a high fat butter, like a European style butter. Like one time I went home and tried to make croissants for my parents. And then I got like, you know, butter from like the convenience store and that was a waste of time. <laughs> waste of time and money. So. Don't do that. You have to get the good stuff in the beginning. Okay, a little wide. The butter blocks a little wide. Just fill this out a little bit to make it fit. You basically want, you don't want too much butter sticking out, or else you're going to make a mess in your sugar. Conveniently, I have. I'm going to try to patch this up, but I think it's still going to split when I cheat. So. It's just a demo, it's okay. But ideally your butter block won't split. I don't think this is gonna do much of anything. I'll have an idea. So I'm just trying to melt it together so it has like a big overlap so it's less likely to split. What? It could split. All right. So anyway, you got the butter in. The goal is to fold it over, which we got. Great. Dough in the middle, but that's okay. Trim things. Anyways, you can see in the dough that it's like very flecky. Um, you can still get a lot of the whole grain aspect without compromising the structure of the croissant. Um, and I think you would get, I feel like you would get a similar, at least equal product with high extraction flour. I'm going to try to fill that up a little bit. But I've seen, I don't know, either Christy Tin and her Jory Downer do is just, you know, trim from the edges because you know that's going to be like extra doughy. And then use that to patch up spots. And now. I'm not like formally trained or anything. I've just been doing things on the job and just based on experience, these little, these little tricks work in the end. <laughs> All right. Then it's gonna get loud because I basically have to make this huge block of dough fit under the uh, sheeter bar. So just take a moment. 
want to make sure there's flour underneath like you're rolling a pie dough. Make sure that the dough moves and doesn't get stuck on the table when you're doing this. All right, Josh, step back. <laughs> Which way is more uh, useful? I'm this way? This. Yeah. Oh, okay, you're whacking. Yeah. Okay. So the way I like do the rolling pin, I sort of do it like in a windshield wiper sort of way. So I know that this edge is going to be wider than this side. So then I do a lot of rotating. And I also rotate top and bottom because I know since I've smashed, the top half is going to be flatter than the bottom. So I flip it over, do the same thing. And make sure the dough is not too far away because you're going to like bang the table. Now I can see this was the far edge and it's a bit wider than this. Let me do my pounding out again that way a little bit. On the other side, just make sure everything is more or less even. Okay, now we get to the sheeter. So I have this like you know, small tabletop sheet, but by small is actually quite large for the space we have. Even though it has this like, you know, non-stick canvas, you want to make sure nothing ever sticks or gets too sweaty. So I'm going to sheet this down. Just my standard is seven, and then you'll see. This is a very large piece of dough. Uh, this is actually twice what we would fit into the sheeter. So I'm going to divide this in half. And the awkward way I do that with this small table is I try not to stretch the dough, pulling it in large, you know, with two hands at the same time. So I'm not yanking on anything. And sort of give a little crease so I know approximately where halfway is. Hold it. Hey, no breakage from what I can see. So this is, you know, a first, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> Just putting the butter in the dough this is the first part. And it looks, it looks even. So I'm happy with that. Okay. Yeah, I'm just dividing this in half because, like I said, this is this yields twice what we would what we are normally going to put into the cheese. If you do the mental math, that makes this like pretty quick because you don't want them to be sitting out, especially on a warm day. Okay, so now I've divided this half by weight. So basically I'm gonna be doing the first and second turns on this dough in this one step. This came from a class from another weed stock from uh, William Lehman, kind of a lamination master. Uh, 
Now these little nubs that I'm doing are sort of a, a, a little hack that I learned. Not really a hack, but you know, we don't trim anything until the very, 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 very end. Okay, so these are like the weird loose pieces and this is like a solid piece. So I'm gonna put these loose pieces on the inside. So they're gonna be secure and they're not gonna break off in the sheeter. Okay, so that's first turn. Now, second turn, I'm gonna go straight into that. And in the end, we're gonna do three singles. So my goal is to sheet this out to about like 12 or 13 inches. Um, yeah, and then I'll rotate it 90 degrees, then I'll do the fold and then set that away for about 45 minutes to relax and chill. Oh yeah, and tools that I have always are a ruler, serrated knife, this is the adult one, rolling pin and uh, things for croissants, so like a bicycle and uh, a really sharp piece of cutter. Okay. This is like, okay, I'm gonna go a tiny bit more. I'll go like, yeah, I'll lean towards 15, so just a little more. Okay, that. Degrees. So basically, I just widened it so that I get the final folded piece basically to the dimensions of, which will vary depending on how much dough and butter that you're working with. So just take some experimentation and what works with your equipment and your space in your freezer, et cetera. So I just sheeted that down to seven thickness on the Rondo sheeter. And just do like gentle squaring off. Again, no trimming because I don't like to waste things. Let's see which one looks worse. Whatever, whichever one looks worse, is this one. It's gonna go on the inside. That should be. You want to make sure that the top folded edge um, meets up with the other edge here. So it's nice and square. All right. So then in theory, I would do this again with this piece and then set them both aside for 45 minutes. And then I have the next stage already set up. All right. I'm going to run away again. <laughs> All right, so this is ready actually for the uh, wow, final sheet out. Ready? I guess so, yeah. Um, so I've already done two other turns, uh, one other turn, um, and this is ready for the final sheet out and shaping. So in between turns, I put this in the freezer. Um, not enough to freeze, but to chill the outside and keep everything cold without being solidly frozen. Now I'm just feeling for anything that's too cold and if it is a little on the frozen side. You can also see like sheets of butter, which is not good because I was rushing the prep and the butter sort of broke, but that's okay. It should be, you shouldn't see splotches like that. It should be pretty even to the eye. Okay, so 
But if it's on the cold side, which this one is, I take a rolling pin and sort of soften it up. Of course, the edges are going to be what freezes first. And you can also hear a little bit of a difference of like where the butter is frozen or where it's like still just full. And doing this gentle smashing is fine because that's what you're doing with the cheater. Smashing the layers. Basically, I'm doing this so that when it goes to the sheeter, the edges don't split and crack. I want everything to be basically a, a similar temperature and consistency. Seems okay. So out of these, I'm going to make plain croissants, which I will, my goal is to sheet it up to about 14 inches wide and then however long it comes out. And if you get about 25 pieces from this one block, 24, 25. A tiny bit of condensation because I put a, a warmish room temperature piece of dough or a cool piece of dough into it. A little moisture, so add a little flour to make sure there's no cracking and splits. Okay. Oh, because I sheet it down to seven every time, seven times three, because you're doing the triple, you know, a single fold, you know, three layers. Essentially, you could start your sheeter at 21, but 24 is a good place to start. Just a little wiggle room in case the dough grows in the freezer or whatever. You don't want the sheeter to break up your dough. But yeah. Not quite there. The middle's about 14, but I also want it to be as square as possible. It was magic of gentle wiggling and stretching. It's like it's like yoga for not. Okay. I like to go through a couple times like on the same number just to sort of ease the piece into shape without like forcing it prematurely to the next like um I don't know, the next interval that I want. I know that just don't and don't forget nothing. That's 14, but I think I'm going to aim for 14 and a half, knowing that it's going to shrink back. So ideally, I would have them more square. So I will address that. There we go. Kind of a big difference, but I and a little more, a little more. <laughs> I'm going to sheet this down to three. Before I get to three, I'm going to sort of help stretch it out a little bit. You can already you can see the stress in the butter, so I don't want to, you know, manhandle it too much. but. Just sort of guide it a bit. 
I don't get those pieces, but hopefully I will. Basically, as it gets thinner, it's easier to manipulate, but I don't want to wait to the very end to do that. Because we have to do a lot of wrangling of equipment. Anyways, again, what I really like about this croissant is the flex, and you can definitely see it as the dough gets thinner. And you don't want, you know, the big flex to be like cutting the gluten, which makes nice lofty croissant. But you know, we've got we've got 25% in this, um, which we originally had started with 33%, but that's when we also had like finer flour. So we tried it with 32%. But the croissants were just like kind of shrinking. Let's change the ratio a little bit. You know, have a better, better volume croissant. All right. So I'm going to trim the edges, the top and the bottom, so it has exposed layers. Tough here. This is really the only point in the whole process where I end up with scrap. Um, you know, so I don't have enough scrap to make like. Cool things like a croissant loaf, which I suppose suppose we could, but you know we also have extremely limited freezer space. So with the scrap, we collect everything and make one bread out of it. Or something they do with clear flour, uh, low clear flour, and um, you know a very limited uh, amount of these items that customers get. And when they do see it, they go crazy. And they're like, oh, they're going to sell out. Thank you, know. Thank you for buying our, our scraps. So. All okay. right, that up later. So croissants are three and a half inches wide at the base, not the most strict thing, but it's fine. So, handy ruler as always. Uh, a bicycle, three and a half. I like this one, but make my marks. It's fine. I'm gonna offset this by three and a half, which is one and three quarters. Okay, do the same thing on this side. Okay. 
them with the bicycle. Now, the scary part, cutting things, putting the triangle. So I'm going to go from this bottom mark to that top mark every time. And then I'll go back through and then finish making sure. kind of confident with your pizza wheel because you go too slow, the dough can sort of drag on the blade and also end up with a wobbly line. The faster you go, the straighter your line will be, which is also true with uh, scoring bread. All right, I've got triangles. Quickly shape them up. No. Again, this is from uh, Jeremy Godwin. He does not do the uh, the stretch of the dough, but he does leave like a little gap, a little air gap, so that the croissant has room to grow out, and the tail doesn't like flip up. Just can do this all the way across the row, and. Good if you can practice doing this with two directions. There's less handling of dough. Or minimal handling of dough. This is undone. This goes back in the freezer. And then sell them over the wheat. And with the triangles, and you can fill them with stuff. So we do like a ham and cheese. Uh, you can fill them with jam, you can fill them with vegetables, do like, like you know, a piece of something like on the whitest part and then roll it up. Handle everything exactly the same. Um, so we keep them frozen. We retard slash proof them overnight. And then uh, first thing in the morning, you get like a little egg wash. Um, I have two ovens here. I have a deck oven and a convection oven. Um, I was trying them in the deck oven and they just didn't turn out as well as like vibrant looking. They do in the convection oven. So we eventually switched over to convection. Also the deck oven is busy with bread in the morning. So it's nice having the, uh, the luxury of the second oven <laughs> when I need it. Um, so we get our whole wheat flour from our uh, actual friends. We used to work with uh, the wife Alyssa at her farm over at Elmendor, which is Cambridge, where not all the things like that. I don't know. I don't have a car, so maybe it's like a 15, 20 minute drive away. Maybe I'm in her community, Boston traffic. Um, they're great. They have a new American stone mill in their shop, and we sell lots of green grains. The customers, lots of home bakers, um, all places like us. And yeah, got some boy flour yesterday that was just fresh off the mill. Um, you know, they have all the heirloom varieties, interesting varieties we use to blend because it's the only thing that we And yeah, I'll that. Like you could get Redeemer, Red Pipe. Is a bit more exotic. We're trying to keep things like simple yet mildly exciting here. I guess that's the motto. Mildly exciting. And Elmendorf does not uh, do 
large amounts of sifting. So we actually get the flour that we use for our bread, which is high extraction flour. Um, it's from ground up grain out of Hadley, Massachusetts. And they are also great. We're trying to support the local grain economy and you know make things tasty and you know sneak in some whole grains for our customers. Uh, wording of flour and you know nutrition is a little weird, but technically this has 25% whole wheat as opposed to you know sifted wheat. It depends on if you are aiming for a local or whole grain or I'm not sure. I guess there are other uh, permutations. Or, uh, we can say that we have whole grain in our whole in our uh, Okay, and then with our scrap, logs right there. What we do with our scrap is just come up with like little, I don't know, logs, little nodules of dough. And then for our monkey bread, we scale them about like 120 to 130 grams of scrap for each uh, jumbo size muffin tin. I tried them before with like no paper liner. And that was. A real mess. So now we do it with a paper liner. Make sure we can we tuck in a few pieces of chocolate. Getting quite warm in here. I think that's it. Um, basically, I just did a demo using some whole wheat flour, or you could have used extraction flour, but it's going to be usable for us. This is our standard croissant. For me, I'm running away again. So I have a couple of croissants that we had baked up yesterday. So currently our business is only open three days a week. So today we're not baking. Yesterday we baked, tomorrow we're baking. So anyways, this is a uh, final product. Um, fine looking croissants. You can still see the flex and the flavor is quite good. All right, all right the, uh, the baking. I think I explained a little bit of the baking, but we use a convection oven. Um, you know, it took a little bit of experimentation, but we have it at 350 degrees on a high fan. Um, bake for 16 minutes total. We put it in a bag, give it to customers. So let's take a quick look inside. Um, get two croissants in case I mess one up. Um, oh no. so I, I feel like they're well baked, they're light, they're not doughy. Um, yeah, let's take a look. Hang on, you're real out of focus at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah, got a nice, nice honeycomb. And then you can still, again, see the flex on the inside. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with the flex. But um, when you eat it also, you get little nubs of grain, or sorry, of the bran, just kind of, I think, a bonus. Put it the other way. So, you know, we make too many of these, which I often uh, overestimate how many croissants people will actually buy. We'll turn them into almond croissants. 
So hole in the middle there. That bit of blue. And plenty of uh, pockets to hold simple syrup and uh, your frangipan or whatever. I've seen other people do regular jam, uh, you know, probably even a twice baked ham and cheese croissant, or if you're vegetarian, no ham, cheese and roasted vegetables. Um, right. I hope this was helpful. And thanks for watching. All right. Welcome back. We we're live again. And uh, I'm sitting here wanting a croissant now. Daisy, how are you doing? <laughs> That's your first time you saw the video, too, right? After you filmed it. <laughs> I noticed in the Q and A that was coming in that you actually filmed this about a, a three or four weeks ago, about a month ago. It was a little mm -hmm. cooler that day. So what were your so uh, before we throw because we're getting kind of close to the end of the hour. I mean we'll run over a little bit. We'll run over a little bit, but we'll continue more Q and A in the VIP lounge. But for those who aren't able to join us, we'll take a couple of key questions. But any final comments uh, before we th do throw it open? Anything you noticed? Things you wanted? Mm. Oh yeah, what I wanted to say about like using like high extraction flours in croissants, um, was that that particular batch of flour of high extraction flour we were using for bread was particularly dry. So that's why I didn't want to demo with it because it the croissants were just super tight and we just don't normally make croissants with high extraction flour. And I was like, I can try to do this and it just wasn't like up to snuff. So I said, I'm just gonna do it the way we normally do it. The way, with the whole wheat flour. The way you normally do it is a blend. Uh, you kind of create your own uh, equivalent of high extraction by going 20% yeah. whole wheat. And it's more, it's not a fine grind whole wheat because you like the flex. I do too. I'm, a, I, I'm obsessed with flex too. <laughs> I love to see those little bits in there. Um, and so well, basically the flour we have access to. So, I mean, like, you know, I'm trying to use what I have around me. Because the whole wheat flour that you're getting is local, locally milled. It's not... Right. The King Arthur's your your bread flour, but the uh, but the the local flours the, where you get your whole wheat and and essentially they're probably uh, when you say stone mill stone mill, mm -hmm. uh, so you're getting a coarser flour to begin with. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and I know some of the questions that came in had to do with the type of flour. Uh, does it do you vary based on what's available? Can you use any type of whole wheat flour? Or do you like to stick to a particular type? Are you doing? Uh, mm -hmm. We pretty much do like a standard, you know, 75, 25, you know, bread flour, whole wheat flour. Um, we were using flour from a different milling company and theirs was like even coarser. So then I found another mill that was even closer to us in proximity and they were able to grind it a little bit finer. So switched over to them, but it's been Glenn the whole time. Uh -huh. um, so that I know that I'm just kind of jumping in on some of the questions. Uh, you, I was surprised that you bake it at 350. That's a lower temperature than a lot of places, but it works for you. But I, I guess you have a strong convection in your oven. Is yeah, that... yeah, we have like the option of a low fan and a high fan. I don't know. The, the convection oven came with the business that I purchased. So I was like, I guess I'll just learn how to use this oven. That's how we <laughs> all start. You know, we it's get... pretty, it's, yeah, it's a pretty powerful fan. So it works for us. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking at any other you you answered a lot of the questions on the discussion so uh oh, i'm quick with the typing i saw that that was great <laughs> Most of you, if you uh, go to the answered questions you'll see that daisy's responses there was also uh i think there's no open questions left so all of them have been in the answered column um uh there's a couple other things that i noticed let me see if we go back to my notes yeah but the mixing the dough itself i know that you did a little time lapse there that, that you mix longer than what you showed in the video but but that was a pretty stiff dough much stiffer than right. i than i would expect um yeah and i and i suppose that that's because you've got the um availability of that sheeter to be able to really exert exactly yeah there's no way i would do this by hand and i was doing it by hand when i was doing a pop-up at a local sandwich shop but i was like i can't like I'm, my wrists are hurting i can't do this so i'm like Sheeter or bust. Right, right. And the sheeter makes it possible to, yeah. uh, what's the word, sustain the pace because, so yeah. how does it, so typically, and you, just so for the, for the sake of the people coming, Breadboard Bakery, uh, it's, it's a small local, you sell mostly direct to the customers, mm -hmm. the farmers markets, or do they come to you or how does that nope. work? 
they come to us. <laughs> yeah, we just try to keep everything in here for now and like eventually we'll have somewhat of a better idea of like how we're gonna open a little more to the public. We're gonna close for a month because we really need a break. Uh -huh. We're tired. <laughs> how many of you are there in the operation? How many people do you have working with you? And there's five of us total, which includes my husband and me. Yeah, so I have one full-time baker, two part-time bakers. Um, so that's the, so the three of them are the equivalent of like one and a half bakers, one and a half full-time bakers. And there's me, which is, I'm not sure what I count as. And then my husband. So you're, you're the tornado. You do everything. Um, I guess so. <laughs> what, uh, what else besides croissants do you, do you sell? Oh, bread. My name is Bread Board Bakery. <laughs> uh, hearth breads, basically. Yes. Uh, yeah. Breads, uh -huh. yep. uh, and monkey breads, apparently. A few, a few monkey bread loaves. Uh, just, just a few, yeah. Whatever, yeah. whatever the scrap will allow. But oh uh, yeah, no waste. <laughs> well, that's my goal. You know, a lot of people when they get up to scale, you know, they I can see you see it. And I have a presentation towards the end of the symposium by a bakery that started out about your size that grew into you know, a pretty large scale bakery in St. Louis called Companion. And he's doing a whole presentation on, on the analysis he did of how much waste he had and scrap mm -hmm. that was going into the, just into the dumpsters that when he analyzed it, he realized how much profit he was throwing away. And so they, so he's going to do a whole presentation on the study that he did and how he repurposed his systems there. Mm -hmm. to, to I need to log back in for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But the larger you get, you tend to not think about that because I've been in some big operations where they just go, hey, it's such a small percentage, so we don't care about right. it. When you're small, every piece of dough, when I had my bigger, I didn't want to throw away anything, you know. Oh, yeah. It's like I, I, I make, I keep my numbers, my pars pretty tight. So, and if like I don't have what someone wants, then hopefully they'll be directed to like a different similar product or something that they haven't tried before, which might turn them on to a new product, so. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of end with this question, then we'll, we'll reconvene in the in the VIP lounge for a more relaxed conversation with yeah. uh, well, the people who are willing to be seen can put their pictures. Up. <laughs> um, um, but um, just some practical questions. So, how long have you been? In, how long has Breadboard been in operation? Hmm, since November 2019, so a year and a half. Uh, yeah, so, and and a lot of what you. You, you referenced a lot of things that you learned from some, you know, some very well-known bakers, Jeremy and others who, who, uh, who rep Jeremy represented the uh, United States at the Coupe de Monde competition. So, and he mm -hmm. was, he was our Van Wassery cat uh, baker for that competition. Jer Jeremy is a Gagois, is that how he says the lesson? I think so. <laughs> did, you, did you come up learning ba uh, bread baking through workshops through the bread bakers guild or through uh culinary school or how did you learn your skills <laughs> i learned it all at clearflower and then um my bosses at the time abe and chrissy basically were like you need to join the bread bakers guild and then they like sent me to as many classes and you know camp bread wheat stock all those you know conferences as much as possible and you like lucky. that's just how i've met a lot of people too uh, you were lucky to be at clearflower and abe and chrissy were really founding members of the guild mm -hmm. and so, uh, so you really did get to learn from, you know, from the, the first generation of sort of exactly, the, yeah. And so that's pretty how, fortunate. And then, and then uh, what gave you the courage to um, launch your own operation? Mm, <laughs> I don't know. It was just like after after a while, there wasn't much more I could do at Clearflower besides, you know, all the shifts, and I'd already done all the shifts. So it's and, time to spread your wings. Exactly. And like, I wanted to try different flowers, different techniques and, you know, make more mistakes on my own, basically. <laughs> and it's also a long commute from Arlington into, uh, into Brookline to, 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 to each day. To work in there. Yeah. Well, now, I mean, at the time when I was working at Clearfly, I lived a five minute walk away and then my husband and I moved to Arlington for the bakery. So again, well, I think my commute has increased by 50%. So now it's like an eight minute walk. <laughs> um, still, yeah, you keep it you know, within walking distance. That's oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, well, congratulations on all you're doing. And I'm glad that you're back up in operation. And, uh, you know, any, any, you have sort of a vision for where, how big you want to 
make it now where you want to take this uh or are you just going to sort of play it by ear play it by ear and keep it small I, mean, I feel like the more people that get involved and in, the more people i hire then the less i am hands-on things and i really like being a part of the daily operations it's like every every morning i, I do the bake and like you know the three days that we're open a week and like baking is kind of my favorite yeah. Mixing is good, shaping is good, but baking, oh, that's my that's my favorite. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, one question just came in. How do you manage to do these croissants in, during the heat wave? Are you do you have some temperature? Oh, control? we are not doing them. <laughs> that's that's the answer. Um, I I really haven't seen anyone else do this before as a solution, and it's not really like a great solution, but now that it's my business and my bakery, I'm like. Well, we have one AC unit that like is in the dining room. We don't have any customers in here and it's already hot with just like, you know, two or three bodies in here at once and the oven has just been turned off. So anyways, the space is too hot. And I just said no croissants for the summer. They go on vacation. And yeah. so instead we do pies, we do biscuits, you know, other yeah. things. And then when the weather is tolerable again, then we start croissants back up. Go with the seasons. It's like people who, yeah. who are known for tomato sandwiches won't won't sell them except during tomato season because they don't want people to you know exactly like restaurants have seasonal menus why can't a bakery have a seasonal menu as well and like you know i'm i'm not doing like pies and like you know fruity things during the rest of the year so this is the time to sort of showcase those things but you really are part of a, a growing movement of well you're larger than what i would call a cottage bakery you're a small you know, brick and mortar bakery, but there are a lot of cottage. <laughs> Our schedule's on a cottage sort of stuff it's size, not. unfortunately. It's you know what you can manage, but there's a lot of these popping up. That's I see a lot of attendees uh, here. We have attendees that have large bakeries and small bakeries, medium size, mm -hmm. uh, but also cottage and startups. And I think a lot of people want to know. They really want to hear from people that have walked that path. What the what that process is like. Uh, final question. Uh, you you gave a quick reference to the recipe or the formula that you used for your dough, uh, would you mind sending that to me in, a, in an email and we'll post oh, yeah, it. I can do that. We have a folder in the archive section of recipes that have been demonstrated here. And we'll put that in for everybody to be able to download when, you know, uh, in a, next, whenever we get them, you know, we, it's, when you can get it to us. And we'll put it up there so that you can, you all can get that recipe. No problem. I just have to remember to do it. I'm and very tired right us, now, but <laughs> I'll remember. Back, you've got to, You've got to uh, take a little a little jaunt out to Arlington. Very great historical moments, uh, things that, that are out there. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, think of it as the birthplace of liberty. I when I lived in Cambridge, when I when I had my first restaurant, which was in Boston, I lived in Cambridge, and I used to hitchhike out to Arlington. Believe it or not, we're talking about forty years ago for yoga classes that were in Arlington. I think <laughs> one place where I learned uh, uh, Kundalini yoga, and uh, and so I know that path between. Yep. Cambridge, uh, <laughs> all right daisy daisy chow thank you so much breadboard bakery uh arlington massachusetts um uh we saw today uh, again those of you who saw last week's demonstration on um on uh babka where they laminate the babka and there were a lot of similarities and and some differences you know some so they were working on a larger scale uh they did the same thing with their trim though they were making uh, all sorts of uh uh products by you know sort of monkey bread type products from their shrimp. Um, uh, what was the number of folds that you finally, when you when a push came to the shove, how many times in, did you do book folds each and every time? Uh, uh, three single folds. Single folds, so it was just a, yeah. like a, okay. And then, so then your number of layers was only probably about 27 or 27, so. sounds right, yeah. Okay, good to know. That's, those are, again, general questions for those who aren't able to join us in the next round. What we're going to do, I'm going to invite you all to uh, uh, migrate over to the VIP lounge. If you have that, that ticket, we'd love for you. And if you don't have the ticket but want one, uh, just send a quick email through the uh, uh, question at breadsymposium.com and they'll tell you how to, how to upgrade to a VIP. But most of you who are watching right now probably already have it. We're going to take a three minute break. We're going to log out. We're going to log back in and we'll see you all in the VIP lounge for uh, a, a casual chat with Daisy. And thank you, Daisy, for all that hard work and putting that demo together for us. <laughs>
I know it's a lot of work and it's not your, you know, it's not your wheelhouse. And so you really uh, went the extra mile for us. And I really appreciate that. Thanks. I tried. <laughs> you did. It's great. And, uh, and also bring us a sort of a new option to think about is, is incorporating whole grain or high extraction flour when you get the right high extraction flour to work with, you know, mm -hmm. yep. to, to make a croissant that's not just your mainstream white flour croissant, but right. works whole grain in. So thank you. All right, we'll see you in a couple minutes in the VIP lounge. I'm going to log out and we'll see you soon. There's a, uh, for those who want to stay on, you can see the credit scroll, the thank yous. Those of you who have seen it already, just uh, go ahead and we'll meet you over there. Most of you get there before I do. I'll see you in a couple minutes. Bye bye. you to our team behind the scenes. Our event, technical and production partners, Ganoid Communications, including our producer, Gurmit Singh, and his team, Jida Gajaria, Gagandeep Singh, and Jaydev Kashari. Thanks also to Ted Nelson and Lael Fretzel of our creative and marketing team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University who supported me throughout this event. My executive assistant, Sarah Standifer, Communications Director, Melinda Law. Chancellor, Mim Rooney. Charlotte Campus President, Cheryl Richards. And our executive team leaders, deans and faculty, Maureen Dumas, Michael Schrader, Michelle Nicholas, Mark Norman, Brent Steyerwalt, Laurie Heinbach, Jerry Lanuza, Amy Felder, Harry Paymiller, Richard Miskovich, and many, many others. Thank you all.